welcome again. Um, I, it's my pleasure to serve as a moderator for session one. And session one is consistency in labeling, methods to optimize communication labeling, and considerations for best labeling practices. So at this time, I'd like to introduce my speakers. And the first speaker is um, who you just met, Eric Brodsky, uh, who's the Associate Director for the Labor and Development for the FDA. And I'd like to invite uh, my second speaker up, um, and that is uh, Melissa Lee. Welcome. And Melissa is the Director of Global Regulatory Affairs at GlaxoSmithKline. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, inter let uh, Eric take it from there because he's going to lead. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. So here's my disclaimer. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about three different concepts. One is how to potentially ensure consistency throughout the prescribing information. Number two, are labeling considerations on two elements of the prescribing information, the clinical study section of labeling, and addition, additionally, the product quality information and labeling. So this includes information in sections 3, 11, and 16, dosage forms and strengths, description, how supplied, and storage and handling information in the prescribing information. And finally, my third talk is our considerations for a quality check of the prescribing during the end of the review cycle. Not at w when the labeling is at the, at the final, but almost final agreed upon labeling. I will not discuss this during the talk, but I did provide additional slides different labeling considerations, and folks can look at these extra slides um, at their leisure. So number, topic number one, consistency in prescribing information. So during this talk, I'm going to provide some fictitious examples. Um, and these examples may not include all regulatory and statutory requirements. So I tried to pick out one part of the labeling. This is for presentation purposes. So for example, if I did show something about the warnings and precautions section, I may not show uh, a description of the clinically significant adverse reaction or risk. I may not show the outcome, frequency, or risk management. I may only concentrate on the risk management. So it's not to be viewed com incomplete. Also, um, there are examples from derived from approved labeling. And I usually, um, I tried to incorporate as much as I could, but for presentation purposes, I only included information uh, for, for presentation. So some items may be, uh, I didn't include the whole labeling. Also note, these examples are from uh, my recommendations, and may, does not, they do not represent um, FDA's view. So unclear indication or approved population. So in this first example, I'm going to ask the audience to think about where, what is the approved indication or um, approved use? Is it only approved in certain pediatric patients, or is it approved in pediatric patients and adult patients? So when you first look at this, um, I'll give you a couple seconds to look at this. So one could think that this is approved potentially in both pediatric patients and adult patients. The indications and usage is pretty silent on the type of age groups. And the, adult, the dosage administration includes some information about what to do in adults who potentially are high risk for cor um, coronary artery disease. However, if you look further in the labeling, the dosage administration section only provides a recommended dose, dosage in pediatric patients. There's no recommended dosage in patients with adult, in adult patients. So you're wondering if I have an adult patient, what's the recommended dose? I don't know. Um, if the clinical, go down to the clinical study section, it has a description results of two adequate and well-controlled trials only in pediatric patients. There's no description results 
in adult patients. So you may wonder, is it approved in adults and pediatric patients? Or is it only approved pediatric patients? And I don't know the answer to that. I think half the people could say one way, and half the people could say another way. So let's try to ensure some consistency in the labeling. So if the determination is it's only approved in pediatric patients, let's say pediatric patients age 11 years old or greater, this is how you would develop your labeling. The indication would clearly state that this product is approved in pediatric patients 11 years and older with condition Y. The dosage administration section would provide the recommended dosage in pediatric patients in that age group that age subpopulation, and there would be no need to provide some information to prescribers about what to do um, in assessing adults for coronary disease, because coronary disease is generally a disease of adults. And this is not approved in adults. And the clinical study section would include a description results of adequate and well-controlled trials in pediatric patients. So you would have a consistent message throughout the labeling. Okay, so let's say, no, this, it's actually no, the product is approved for adult patients and pedi a certain pediatric patients, pe pediatric subpopulation. How would you develop your labeling? So the indications in usage would clearly state that this is approved in adult patients and pediatric patients 11 years and older. You would include information about assessing for coronary disease in adults because adults is part of the um, population. You would include the recommended dosage in both adults and pediatric patients in that approved subgroup. And, um, right, uh, next um, scenario, implied or suggested unapproved dosage regimen. So this product um, the recommended dosage is 10 milligrams once a day. If you look at the clinical study section, it's a description of a, a clinical study in which patients receive placebo, 10 milligrams once a day, or 20 milligrams once a day. And it presents the res efficacy results from that study. And it, it shows that um, there's a greater improvement of 10 milligrams, numerical improvement at least, 10 milligrams once a day compared to control. Now, just for the, um, this looks at Mayo scores, and for this endpoint, end um, the greater the number, the better the drug looks. So you see numerical improvements of the drug compa compared to placebo, and you see consistency. Now, this fictitious label also, labeling also includes the results from 20 milligrams. 20 milligrams was part of the trial design. However, if you look at it, there's numerical improvements of the 20 milligrams versus the 10 milligrams. And there's a statement that both groups improved greater than placebo. So there's a potential implied implication or suggestion that you could use 20 milligrams. And this is an inconsistency between the recommended dosage and what's presented throughout the label. So what are so what so what are the regulations? So dosage regimen regimens must not be implied in any section of the labeling if it's not included in the dosage administration section of labeling. Similarly, indications and usages must not be implied in any section of the labeling if it's not included in the indications and usage section. So let's say the product um, the intention is that the product's approved, or the recommended dosage is both, the low dose and the high dose, 10 milligrams and 20 milligrams once a day. So this is the labeling approach one would take. So drug X, the recommended dosage is 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams once a day. The clinical studies section would just pre present the results and the description of the 10 milligrams and, one, and the 20 milligrams once a day. You see numerical improvements of 10 and 20 compared to placebo. This is a consistent message in the label. Okay, let's say there's only one approved dose. 
This is one option of addressing the issue. You have 10 milligrams once a day that's recommended, and you only include a description and results of that 10 milligrams. You don't need to include everything about the clinical study in the clinical study section of labeling. You include the information that's necessary for the healthcare pro provider to use the drug safely and effectively. You don't include all the information. In fact, the clinical study rec clinical studies regula regulation sta states that the clinical studies section of labeling is not an encyclopedia of every study conducted. So we don't include all the studies. And occasionally, we don't have a clinical study section of labeling. And we'll talk about that later in one of the pres presentations. So there's a consistency here. Now, what's another option? This option presents a description of the treatment arms. So it shows the 10 milligrams and the 20 milligrams in the clinical study section of labeling, but includes a disclaimer about the 20 milligram dosage. So here we have 10 milligrams approved. Um, again, it describes the 20 milligrams, presents the 10 milligram results, and includes a disclaimer. Gives you a little bit more information about why the 10, 20 milligrams was not approved. So you're mentioning the 20, but there was a concern about adverse reactions. Thus, only the 10 milligrams is recommended, and there's some clarity. So there are many different ways, ways of approaching consistency in labor. Next, next example. So I'm going to ask you, what is the recommended duration of use for this product? We have a box warning, again, this is a fictitious example, that states that to consider the benefits or risks of using the drug, given adverse reaction Y, after, if you're using the product greater than three months. The dosage administration section, though, implies that after several months, you can increase the dosage. Which is slightly a different message. And the warnings and precautions talks about it increased incidence of adverse reactions after three months, and you shouldn't use drug X after three months. A little bit different everywhere. So what, what, what would you do to address that? If the recommendations are to reuse greater than three months, um, um, consider making it consistent throughout the labeling. Box warning, dosage administration, and warnings and precautions include that same consistent message. Avoid use greater than three months. Now, the recommendation may have been different. Maybe there's no recommendation um, about avoiding use after three months. You can use the drug, which is fine. Make that consistent. Inconsistency between the strengths and the recommended dosage. So here we have one strength, 10 milligram tablet. The recommended dosage it's 10 milligrams once a day. However, in patients with severe renal impairment, the recommended dosage is 5 milligrams once a day. Now, this would be potentially acceptable if the product is functionally scored. However, with this product, it states don't split the tablets. Why? There was a certain cons um, cons um, concern, clinically significant adverse reaction that occurred when you split the tablets. So the message is don't split the tablets. But it's also telling you split the tablets. So what do you do? Well, make the labeling consistent. Um, in this situation, the recommended dosage is 10 milligrams once a day. The tablets are only 10 milligrams. And then for in the use in specific populations, the statement would be something like the use of drug X in patients with severe renal impairment is not recommended. And you can provide the rationale. You can't split the tablets. There's a certain adverse reaction that occurs. This is consistency. Unclear risk management. So I want to ask you, what are the prevention and risk mitigation strategies in patients with severe renal impairment? The contraindications section states that drug X should not be used in patients with severe renal impairment. The warnings and precautions statement says, well, it's not recommended. And the use in specific population section states, well, don't, you can, um, it's not recommended to start a patient 
if they have baseline severe renal impairment, but it suggests if someone has baseline moderate renal impairment and they somehow go, the creatinine clearance goes below 30, and they stay there for a little bit, don't worry about it. They could stay there, but if it's persistently below 30, then you stop it. So three slightly different messages in the prescribing information. So what should a prescriber do if they have a patient with severe renal impairment? From here, it's not clear. So, what you, so the first thing to do is analyze the data. So, it's, so the first thing, go back to the data. What do the data show? Usually these are the lowered, the higher number sections. So for here it's the pharmacokinetic section, subsection in the clinical pharmacology section. Look at the data. Secondly, develop the lower numbered sections. For example, if you're using specific populations, renal impairment. In this section, one includes a description of the clinical implications of the differences in response, safety, or recommended recommendations for use in patients with renal impairment compared to patients with normal renal function. That's what you include in section eight. Additionally, you go to the, the lowest number sections and then you develop risk management there. So again, go back to the data. What are you trying to say? That's the first thing. So here is the data section, a subsection actually, pharmacokinetic subsection. And this presents PK results in patients with severe, moderate, mild renal impairment compared to PK in patients with normal renal impairment. And with severe renal impairment in this example, the exposure is 20 times greater. The AUC of the drug is 20 times greater in patients with renal impairment compared to people, folks with normal renal function. That's the data. Potentially, there were certain adverse reactions seen at this dosage. Uh, potentially, this is a narrow therapeutic index drug. And you're concerned about use in patients with renal impairment because exposure goes up 20 times. So then you develop a, um, a lower number section. For example, the use in specific population, and you communicate that message. So drug X is contraindicated in patients in severe renal impairment because the use of the drug in patients with severe renal impairment was associated with higher exposures and maybe you can include certain adverse reactions. Of course, one, this is one part of the population. One would also want to include risk mitigation, risk management in the other populations. What do you do in patients with moderate renal impairment and mild renal impairment? One will include risk management information in the contraindication section, and you want to use specific wording according to the warnings and precautions guidance that drug X is contraindicated, avoiding the use of the terms should not use. You use the word contraindicated not only in the contraindication section, but throughout the labeling to have a very clear message that the risks of this drug outweighs any benefits of use. Uh, you include risk management information in other parts of the labeling. For example, you include that contraindication. You can include that contraindication in the dosage and administration, in dosage and administration section. In addition, you include the entire, what to do with the entire population. So for patients with moderate renal impairment, you're going to reduce the dosage in people with normal renal function and mild renal impairment, there's no change in dosage. You cover the entire spectrum of renal impairment. Okay, topic number two, new topic, labeling considerations. Particularly for two parts of the labeling, the clinical study section of labeling and also product quality related information labeling. Now we're focusing on the clinical study section of labeling. So here are some considerations. It's very important for development is to look at many statistical populations from the primary efficacy endpoint, the secondary endpoints, the ITT, the MITT, the per protocol, the safety population, many different statistical populations. But 
consider for the healthcare provider if you're listing results from multiple statistical populations, what is the healthcare provider supposed to think? So consider the message. Consider maybe using one statistical population. Again, labeling development communication is different than drug development. Consider using one central ten mean one central tendency like mean or median, not both. Again, you can use this information in um, for drug development, but look at the audience about healthcare providers. Uh, consider rounding up. So if you have um, a differential of 66.5% in the drug in terms of response, and you have 13.2% um, in the control or placebo, you could probably round up. You, you get the picture. If you include additional data um, endpoints, it's harder to view that. Um, also, you can consider not including the number of patients within the boxes. That can be confusing, um, or adding more data um, may, it may be harder to understand or may hamper the ability of the reader to understand the information. Now, if you have results that the drug, uh, the results, the response was 7.3% and the control is 6.3%, even 6.9%, and that's extremely meaningful, um, statistically significant, you would want to include um, those additional um, data. That's very important. You would not want to remove that. So depending upon the situation, use, use your discretion. Um, in general, we recommend including information in the table or text, not both. Why? There's redundancy. And also, it could get discrepant over time. You could have different messages. Uh, define terms that are not well understood by the healthcare provider audience. Maybe this is a specialty drug, and all, this is for, uh, for brain surgeons, and all of them understand a certain terminology. That's acceptable then to use certain term terminology for that healthcare provider audience. However, if you're using a drug for depression, MDD, and um, primary care doctors use it, you want to make sure the broader population understands those terms define them if it's not clearly understood. Um, consider using section headings, not including information between section 14 and subsection 14.1. Potentially it may, um, if you include information under section, section 14, when there's a subsection 14.1, potentially one can miss that information in the electronic world if you click on subsection 14.1. If you click on 14, you'll find that information. The information is there. So if you click on 14.1, you may miss that information in the electronic world. Um, if you have a very complicated clinical study section of labeling, so this is a product that has multiple indications or multiple studies, you could in consider including an overall section, an overview section, a description of the clinical studies in 14.1. In this, in this subsection, you could describe commonality of the studies in terms of the design features, uh, potentially the important baseline disease characteristics, the important demographics that help you interpret efficacy. So this is an example of a recently approved label. We approved this over the summer, a um, antiviral aid, direct antiviral agent. Uh, uh, it's a fixed dose, um, fixed combination drug product, three products in one, uh, approved for hepatitis C. This product had similar trial design. Um, so they included an overview section, a description of clinical studies. It also had a similar endpoint, looking at sustained viral response, hepatitis C, um, at 12 weeks. So you can include the, the, um, the common endpoint in this description of clinical studies overview section, subsection. If you have multiple clinical studies, potentially from different um, therapeutic areas, consider including many different subsections. Actually, that's my next slide. This slide is about um, subsection titles. So subsection titles must be in bold format, and they should be in title case, according to guidance. And consider, and, and consider that the title of the subsection should reflect the information in the section 
or in the subsection. And this is not just for the clinical studies section of labeling, it's for all additional clinical, all additional subsections. So the dosage administration, the warnings, the precautions. Sometimes we see an inconsistency of what the title says and the information in the body. After you develop your body, make sure your title, we recommend that the title is consistent with the information in the subsection. So for example, instead of monotherapy 14.1, you consider saying monotherapy use of drug X in patients with disease Y. Why is this important? Potentially if there are line extensions, there are additional efficacy supplements, additional indications, um, and this is the original approval, you'll go back to and you'll say monotherapy, monotherapy in rheumatoid arthritis, cirrhotic arthritis, um, psoriasis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, what indication are you talking about? Um, in general, consider avoiding conclusions in the table titles. Sometimes we see information about improvement of drug X, although the table describes the results from placebo and drug X. So that's not exactly accurate. So basically, um, avoid conclusions about the study results. As I said earlier, if you have lots of um, studies, consider including these studies in, under different subsections in the clinical study section. Titles of tables and figures. So according to the 2006 clinical study section of labeling guidance, one should include the type of data, time point, patient population, and the study name in the clinical studies section of labeling. Now this is especially important for the reason I mentioned earlier. If you have multiple different indications, and people go to tables, you may not know what is this. Is this MDD? Is this generalized anxiety disorder? Is this bipolar? Is this schizophrenia? If you have a general title, title efficacy results. Efficacy in what population? That's another reminder. When you develop doing an efficacy supplement, go back to the other labeling and make sure there's a consistency. Retitle tables, um, look at the information that, so the information flows. So here are the components. The type of data would be bone mar mineral density. The time point would be change in bone mineral density at, um, from baseline at month 12. A change in baseline at month 12. The patient population of postmenopausal women with osteoporosis and the study title or study name is study one. Consider going back to these elements when developing study, type, study um, figures or table titles in the clinical study section and also all throughout the label. NCT numbers. So NCT numbers are eight digit identifiers that represent a study that is registered on clinicaltrials.gov, an NIH website. NCT numbers are used um, by healthcare providers to identify studies across multiple sources. So for example, and um, what FDA is recently doing is including this information in advisory committee meeting package in our reviews so folks could identify studies and we have also been including this in our labeling. Um, on first use, description of the study in the clinical study section of labeling. And this is an example of including an NCT number in labeling. Uh, labeling considerations for product quality information in labeling. So product title. Product title is a very important part of the prescribing information. It contains up to five elements. The proprietary name, one exists, the non-proprietary name, the dosage form, the route of administration, and the controlled substance symbol, if it's a controlled substance. And it's in a very prominent location in the prescribing information. It's above the initial use approval. It's below the highlights limitation statement and below the highlights heading. And you could see it in yellow font. And this is so healthcare providers can identify the product and the important parts of the product prominently when they look at the prescribing information. 
So the format of the product title, format the product title must be in bold format according to the regulations. The proprietary name, again, if there is one, should be in uppercase according to guidance. Consider um, making the other elements of the product title in lowercase with certain exceptions, like the control substance symbol. So consider uppercase for the proprietary name, if there's a proprietary name, for all the other elements, the non-proprietary name, the dosage form, route administration in lowercase letters. And I presented an example here. My drug um, is the proprietary name. Drugazide is the chemical portion of the non-proprietary name in parentheses. Capsules is the dosage form for route, for oral use. That's the route of administration. Those elements are in lowercase. If there's no proprietary name, include the chemical portion of the non-proprietary name. If this is a drug product or the proper name, um, consider including that in uppercase letters and everything, rest of the product title in lowercase letters. So in this example, drugazide is the chemical portion of the non-proprietary name of the drug product. It's all uppercase, and all the other elements are in lowercase. And these are considerations. You could consider also including a comma um, before the route administration. This is assuming the route administration is not incorporated within the non-proprietary name. And there are certain cases like oral solution, transdermal system, where the route administration, topical solution, the route administration is incorporated or precedes the dosage form. Um, consider avoiding the following information in the product title. Uh, given the promise of the product title and its importance, um, these recommendations are to decrease clutter and potentially to, to, um, to decrease so that a healthcare provider can read these elements and uh, read these elements in the product title. So avoid, consider avoiding additional descriptions like film coded, even though the doses form in the DSM data stat, standual, standard manual or the SPL dosage form terms may include these additional descriptors. It's not, we recommend it's not included in the product title. Methods for intravenous infusions, you'll say for intravenous use, avoid saying um, in, um, bolus, for example, or infusion. Again, it's a very important part of the prescribing information. The details can be included in other parts of the prescribing information. Avoid abbreviations. Additionally, in general, the product origin is not included in the product title, recombinant, for example. That information in general is included in the description section. There are certain exceptions to this. Um, if you have a fixed combination drug product, um, you, we recommend you include an AND to separate those two components rather than a slash. Um, additionally, consider not repeating the route administration the route administration is incorporated within the non-proprietary name, meaning that the route administration precedes the dosage form. Additionally, consider avoiding the terminology USP. If you want to include the USP terminology, you can consider included in sections 3, 11, and 16, the, product, the main product quality sections of the prescribing information. Again, we're dealing with small, um, very important real estate um, for the healthcare provider. So the product title, in, in, with respect to dosage form, if you have a powder, that if a product is a, supplied as a powder, for example, a lyophilized powder, and then is reconstituted to a solution and injected at a solution, the dosage form term is called for injection. It's not powder. So include the term for injection. Um, on the other hand, if you have a solution, um, whether you administer and you inject it, or you have a solution and dilute it, that is called injection. So the dosage form term is injection. Consider avoiding the term only, only for topical use, or only for intravenous use, again, because of the important real estate. 
that additional information descriptors can be included in other parts of the prescribing information. Here are some examples uh, of approved labeling with product titles that are consistent with the regulatory requirements I stated, the guidance recommendations, and some other considerations. These examples are from multiple different types of products, various dosage forms, various routes of administration. One product is a controlled substance. There's also a product that has multiple routes of administration. I include this as a reference. You can go back to this when developing your product title. These all examples include a proprietary name. These examples are products that do not include a proprietary name. These are mo mostly going to be your generic products um, and other NDA products. There are some um, biological products that we have, some older biological products that do not have a proprietary name. This is mostly in CBER. But this, again, is mostly referring to generic products and some NDA products. So if you do not have a proprietary name, one um, you can consider including all uppercase, the chemical portion of the non-proprietary name, or the proper name for a biological product. And you can consider including all the elements in lowercase, except for certain exceptions like the controlled substance symbol. And you can go back to these examples when you develop your product title for products that do not have a proprietary name. OK, so format of the elements of the, proprietary, of the product title compared to format of elements on the card and container labeling? We get this question a lot. So the concepts in the product title, the content of the information in the product title should match and should be, as, I should say, should be as consistent as possible for the elements that are described on the card and container label. They, the content should be as consistent as possible. However, the format and order of information may be a little bit different. So for example, on the card and container labeling, title case is generally used, but the product title, as I stated earlier, proprietary name should be in uppercase letters. In terms of number li of lines, on the card and container labeling, there may, may be many lines. For the product title, we try to keep it on one line if it doesn't go over to two lines. Again, the audience may be a little bit different. The audience for the card and container labeling is generally for the uh, pharmacist audience for prescribing information could be for the pharmacist, pharmacist, but it could also be for the healthcare provider physician. The strength is present, very important to present that on the corner container labeling. It is not presented in the product title. We have some products that have 10 strengths. If you included every single strength, that would be a lot of information in the product title. We do include the strengths and the highlights under the dosage forms and strength section. Sorry, the dosage form and sex strengths heading and highlights. That's very, that's very important. It's a required element. So instead of the product title, include in the DFS heading and highlights. Route administration, we talked about avoiding the word only in the product title. We may include that on the card and container labeling. Methods for um, in, intravenous use, we talked about avoiding the terms infusion, bolus. You may include that on the card and container label. OK, full prescribing information. Now we're going to talk about three sections of the full prescribing information, product quality information. Sections 3, 11, and 16. Section 3, dosage forms and strengths. So there are three required elements for the dosage forms and strengths. Dosage form, part of the title, strength, in this situation, two methods of presentation for the strength are presented. The one is total amount of product per total volume, followed in close proximity, the amount of the product per milliliter. Additionally, the third element is a description of the dosage form. These are the three required elements. One can, can consider including the orders in this format. First the dosage form, then the strength, then the identifying characteristics. That's a consideration. Um, additionally, there may be very, there may be other important information you may want to include in dosage forms and strength section of labeling. 
important information about how supplied, important information about package terms. So does this come in, if it's um, a topical product, 30 gram, the healthcare providers are 30 gram tubes, 90 gram tubes, is this a um, uh, pre-filled syringe, is this an auto injector? That's important information. Single dose vial is this example. So again, recommended consideration for format, dosage form, strength or strengths, description, and then additional information, how supplied information. Here are some examples that follow those considerations that you could look at your leisure. Um, this involved multiple different types of dosage forms, different strengths, and different how supplied information. So consider going back to the slide um, later. There's another example. If you have multiple strengths, you could use a table to present this information. Moving on to section 11, the description section. Here are all the required elements. Frequently, we see some three elements that may not be included. One is the dosage form or dosage forms, the routes of administration, um, and the pharmacological class or the therapeutic class. Typically, we include the established pharmacological class here, how other options or more description can be included. But these are the three elements that we see that are not included. So think about these elements when you're developing the description section. So there are, sometimes we see information in the description section that doesn't potentially belong in the description section. They're not part of the regulations, the description section of labeling. For information may be about pharmacokinetics, absorption. It may be about mechanisms of action. Or it may be about indications. Now, what's the concern about this? Including additional information may hamper the ability of the reader to look at the recommended information or the acquired information. It's harder to see. And you may also get divergence. You may have an inconsistent indication that's stated in, in section 11 and section 1. So consider removing information that belongs in other sections. Storage instructions. We get this question a lot. So what do you put in section 2 versus 16 with respect to storage instructions for diluted or reconstituted products? So the product comes as a lyophilized powder. It's reconstituted. It's there's certain storage conditions, putting in a refrigerator. How, how, um, how long can you can remain in the refrigerator? Do you have to use it immediately? Things like that. Where does it go? That goes in section 2. So, but let's go back. Um, so, in terms of information for the supplied product, that goes in section 16. How supplied in storage and handling. Refrigerate, do not freeze, do not shake. However, if it's a reconstituted or diluted product, detailed description about storage instructions are in section 2 of the prescribing information. You could include some information in section 16 and cross-reference the section 2. And this is a technique to avoid redundancy and avoid discrepancy. So for example, one may include store reconstituted, reconstituted solutions of drug X at Y temperature, refer people to the dose administration section. Last topic, quality check of the prescribing information for format and appearance. So we have the SERPI or selected requirements of prescribing information. This is a 41 item checklist, almost all from regulations. There are some items from guidance. We, recomm we recommend that application holders consider using the SERPI when they submit their labeling towards the end of the labeling review cycle. We understand over time, during labeling discussions, multiple versions of labeling, the format may go off a little bit. So right before the labeling is submitted, almost upon agreed upon labeling, um, consider using the SERPI checklist before you submit your labeling. Back to the FDA. Labeling check um, during the finalization, um, consider removing annotations line numbers, headers and footers, 
also consider in checking the columns. So according to guidance, the highlights of prescribing information and the table of contents should be in a two-column format. Um, consider that the full prescribing information is in a one-column format to improve the ability of the healthcare provider to read that dense information with tables. Sometimes we've seen uh, full prescribing information in two columns and it ends on section two and begins in pharmacodynamics. And it's potentially confusing to follow that information. So for electronic labeling, um, we recommend using um, a one column format for the full prescribing information. We recommend you consider using that. So this example, I want to ask um, the audience to think about what can be improve, improved. So this is actually derived from our um, labeling template that appears in the PLR requirements for prescribing information website. So one can remove the line numbers. Again, this is almost agreed upon prescri prescribing information. Remove information about um, uh, page numbers if it's inaccurate. So for example, the, this is page one. This is not page three. So it says page one. It's got a reference to the, um, the common technical document, 1.14.1.3. That may not be understandable for a healthcare provider. Um, there are two dates here, and the dates conflict. So it says draft labeling in August, and it was revised in October. That's an inconsistency. I think what happened is the last labeling submitted was in, in August, and the labeling was approved in October. So there's an inconsistency there, there. Consider removing the dates, the annotations. It also states draft labeling and says confidential. Now, it is confidential in terms of interactions with the FDA, but before, right before you want it, during the final labeling discussions, we recommend you remove these annotations so they do not appear on drugs at FDA. And this looks, this is the annotations removed. So summary, ensure a consistent message throughout the prescribing information. If there's an inconsistent message, go back to the data. What is your message? Labeling considerations uh, for the clinical study section of labeling and product quality information and labeling. And finally, consider doing a final check of the format and appearance of the prescribing information um, on the almost agreed upon prescribing information. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I have extra slides that you can look at later. Uh, now I would like to reintroduce to you Melissa Beeman um, from Global Labeling uh, from GlaxoSmithKline. Welcome, Melissa. Good morning. I'm Melissa Beeman. I'm the U.S. Labeling Director for Artwork Coordination and Delivery for GlaxoSmithKline. A disclaimer. My agenda today will, will be to provide, provide a brief overview of why I'm here, what I'm going to be talking to you about, and then I'll discuss some best labeling practices and some editing issues. GSK interacts with many FDA review divisions and reviewers, including CEDAR and CEBER, in reviewing labeling products across multiple therapeutic areas. In-house, labeling also interacts with many reviewers, statistical reviewers, medical reviewers, regulatory reviewers, legal reviewers, all of whom have their own style preferences regarding labeling. So I'm going to provide some examples today of how labeling at GSK has attempted to mitigate some of these differences of opinion by developing standards or best labeling practices. Some of these examples might appear to be trivial to you and not materially affect the content of the labeling, but the varied preferences of the different reviewers adds complexity to the labeling review process. 
errors are more likely if we have to remember that one division or one labeling review person re prefers one style for this product and another person re prefers another labeling style for another product or another therapeutic area. And it also adds for confusion further down the line for the production type setters and proofreaders. So today, for our purposes, best labeling practices will be defined as standards or guiding principles that GSK has adopted. These may be based on the regulations, guidances, feedback from FDA review of labeling, and or internal preferences or procedures. Some of the best labeling practices I'll discuss today are listed in this slide. Prescribing information and patient information version and dating, cross-references, um, few instances where it may, it may be preferable to avoid being too specific, recent major changes, highlights, full prescribing information, and other general tips. Um, prescribing information, version, and dating. The information on this slide is available in the guidance implementing the PLR content and format requirements dated February 2013. I'm bringing them to our attention today because there's often confusion about when to change the date and when not to change the date. So specifically for changes being affected submissions, the date on the PI should be the date of the submission. When the, when the submission is approved, if there are no edits to the content of the labeling, the date on the PI should remain the date that it was submitted. However, if there have been content changes to that CBE submission, then the date should change to the date the FDA approved the submission. For patient information version and dating, this is another issue that often causes confusion as to when to change the dates. Um, at GSK, we consider these documents to be separate from the prescribing information itself. So we provide separate dates and separate versioning for these leaflets. Um, so there also there may be instances where your PI has one date and your patient information has a different date, but that's perfectly okay because they shouldn't change. We don't think they should change unless there is a content change to the labeling. The format for that date should also be um, the word revised and then the month and the year in either of those two formats on the slide. So in summary, the up Update the revision date, the month, year, at the end of the FDA approved patient labeling or patient package inserts only when the content changes. Now I'll discuss cross-references a little bit. Um, cross-referencing is encouraged because it refers the reader to more information or related information on the topic. For instance, and it may be required, for instance, in the box warning, or the clinical study sections where a discussion of uh, risk that relates to the use of the drug may be discussed in more detail in other sections. It reduces the need to repeat the detailed information. And they're also particularly helpful in Section 17, patient counseling information. And make sure that if you use a cross-reference, that the cross-reference provides additional information in the section you're cross-referencing to. Okay. Here's an example of the cross-reference from patient counseling information. Um, the, the information under immunizations, subheading in patient counseling, provides the um, healthcare provider some information to provide to the patients. But then the reference to warnings and precautions 5.7 refers to 5.7 warnings and precautions immunization section where more detailed information is found. And while we're looking at this, we might as well talk about the format of the cross-reference. Um, it should be in brackets um, and refer to the section heading and then in parentheses the subsection heading. I mentioned avoiding being too specific. In some cases, it, it's um, important to not specify the specific number of cases. For instance, in overdose section or the adverse reaction section, I have a couple examples here. Um, the first example where I specify two cases, 
Um, it'd be better to state that it was or had been reported because if another, if you specify two cases and you have another case reported, your labeling's already out of date. You need to update it. So if you just if you're a little more less specific, this eliminates the need to update the labeling when additional information is collected. In the full prescribing information, as Dr. Brodsky mentioned, it's important to capture all of the information under a section heading, subsection heading, um, and not to have text between the main section heading and the subsection heading. Because as, as he mentioned, in the ele electronic world, this is considered floating information, and it might be missed when people are searching through the insert. Um, this is especially important in dosage and administration. But however, in clinical studies, in adverse reactions section six, it's not applicable because in, in um, section six, you usually list the clinically significant adverse reactions right after section six heading and prior to subsection 6.1. I'll provide a few tips to reduce the highlights length. We've all struggled at one time or another to try to keep the highlights to half a page in length. We've tried to squeeze up the space between the lines. We've tried to extend the margins as far as we can. We've tried to reduce the space between the headings. And FDA comes back and goes, make that heading, the space is a little bit bigger. So um, just help out here. Um, summarize your information. It doesn't have to be complete sentences. It needs to be the summary. Use the active voice. Example here is instead of saying live vaccines should be given, should not be given, state do not give live vaccines. For more complicated information, use tables. Um, this is particularly helpful in multiple for products with multiple dosing regimens. Use bulleted lists. They can usually be short and succinct. Make sure your margins are half an inch. Squeeze all the space out of that you can. And reduce the space between the bullets and the beginning of the text. We've done that uh, quite a few times as well. And we've changed, actually changed our standard format to squeeze up that space. Um, and the last one is do not repeat warnings that are in the warning box in the highlights. Again, don't repeat them again then in the highlights section, warnings and precautions. You don't need to repeat that information twice in the highlights. Recent major changes. Recent major changes can be a bit confusing sometimes if you have more than one change. So this slide's going to provide some tips for managing that situation. So if you have multiple changes in recent change, if you have multiple changes to more than one section of the labeling, the recent major changes must be presented in the order in which they appear in the full prescribing information and not ordered by the dates of the changes. There is more than one change in the same labeling section or subsection in the preceding 12 months. Use only the newest date. If there are changes to more than one subsection in a section, list these separately if space permits. However, if keeping the highlights to less than one half page is an issue, then you would consider only listing the main section heading with the date of the most recent change. And I have an example on this slide. The first example, we have three sections referenced under dosage administration at different dates. This is, this is just a fake example that um, August 2017 date wouldn't be there if the date is September 2. Um, well, yeah, it would be. Anyway, I was thinking the wrong year. Um, but we have three dosage and administration references, and then under recent major changes, because that may have spread the highlights out to more than half a page to save space, we just referred to dosage administration, recommended dosage, and just the major section heading, section two, with the most recent date. This slide provides some other general tips on items to check when you're preparing your labeling. 
um, does your your labeling your changes to your prescribing information and your patient leaflet might affect your container labeling. This would be perhaps storage statements, warnings and precautions, amounts of the ingredients, reconstitution instructions. Always check to make sure that your prescribing information, any changes to your prescribing information affect your container labeling and vice versa. Oops. Do you have websites in your labeling? Check your website links. Are the websites still active? Are they up to date? If not, either update, make sure the website links are updated or remove them. Phone numbers. Do you have phone numbers in your labeling? Are they still active? Are they still applicable? Um, as Dr. Brodsky mentioned, it's not um, preferable to mention numbers in text and, not, and have numbers in the table. But if you do have that in your insert, check to make sure that your numbers match. Table of contents headings. Do they match the full prescribing information headings? That's an easy one to miss when you're updating your, your full prescribing information headings. Sometimes it's very easy to miss updating your TOC to go along with those updates. Section references, are they still accurate? You've deleted a section somewhere along the way or added a section or moved sections around, your section references are going to change. So make sure they are all accurate and point to the right place. And a checklist might be helpful for all these little items. We, we at just GSK have developed a checklist with a lot of these reminders plus more and incorporated the FDA's selected requirements of prescribing information checklist in it. And we do use that checklist prior to submitting a document to FDA and then prior to the, the final submission, as Dr. Brodsky mentioned, and then before we send it to production as well. I'll talk about some editing and format issues. I like this slide because an awful lot of times we get the comments that either we're obsessed or we're possessed, one or the other. And um, we have to remind people that that's part of our job and to leave us alone and let us do our job. So some of the editing and format issues I'll discuss are um, product title and highlights, the highlights box warning, font style for headings and subheadings, table of contents, use of signs and symbols, and abbreviation. Dr. Brodsky already talked about this one, but it's in my slides as well, so I'll just reinforce the information. Um, the product title should appear on one line in highlights. In the first example, um, the title is separated into two lines with the trade name and generic name on one line and the dosage form and route of administration on the second line. And it's preferable to have that all on one line. And then also, as he mentioned, we use the lowercase for dosage form and route of administration. A boxed warning and highlights. Boxed warning and highlights must contain a concise summary of all the risks described in the boxed warning in the full prescribing information. It's limited to 20 lines, not including the title and the required statement, see full prescribing information for complete boxed warning. Format for some, some of this is specified in guidances. The title should be uppercase, centered, See full prescribing information for complete boxed warning should be immediately following that and centered as well and bold. Um, all the text, all the other text in the box should be bold as well. Recommend using bullets. Um, summarize concisely to try and keep it short. You only have 20 lines. And we've often had the comment from FDA to add that little bit of white space between the statement, the required statement, and the information in the box. And I have an example on the next page. This example, the title is uppercase, bold, centered. The required statement is completely is immediately following it and bold font. And then there's that white space that FDA likes. 
and then the information is bulleted. In font style for headings and subheadings. Font style for headings and subheadings can be important in the insert. Um, in the PI, there's sections that are that where there are typically several levels of subheadings. Um, what we call subletting sublevels three and four, sometimes even five. And this usually occurs in clinical trials, uh, pregnancy, and the pharmacokinetic section. And the information I have on this slide mentioning using the title case and underlining or italics, but not both, for the subsection headings comes from the guidance clinical pharmacology section of labeling for human prescription drug and biological products content and format. I have an example. Well, the key is to be consistent throughout the labeling. And my example here on the next page is our third level he heading is specific population that's underlined. And it's on a line by itself. And this is just GSK format. This isn't required. This is just how we have interpreted the guidance and how we have set up our template. Um, the third level heading is underlined on a line by itself. Fourth level heading, heading is italicized, and we have the text immediately following on the same line. We've done that. Um, we've, we've had comments from FDA to put that heading on a line by itself, but we've been consistent throughout the insert and shown FDA that this is our standard format, and we all know how valuable real estate is on a typeset PI. And typeset PI is going to be typeset the way we have this word document typeset. So to save, save room, save lines, we keep it on the same line. And once again, the key is to be consistent. Dr. Brodsky talked about the table of contents. Um, it needs to be a two-column format, as he mentioned. Columns should be evenly spaced, columns aligned. The first entry of the second column should be aligned with the first entry of the first column. It's been zipped on that a couple times. It shouldn't line up with the full prescribing information content statement. Columns should be approximately the same length. Section numbers and headings aligned and subsection numbers and subheadings aligned. Here's an example. You see 8.2 lactation in the second column is lined up with indications and usage in the first column. The columns are approximately the same length. Subheadings and section numbers are aligned and major sections and headings are aligned. Talk about signs and symbols in labeling. Um, when we've all been confused when, when we should use a sign or when we should spell out the words, which should we use? And there's no hard, fast rule for this. FDA doesn't have a style guide. We don't necessarily have a style guide for that either. Um, you need to consider if the symbols will create potential for errors, basically in, especially in the prescribing the medication or administering the medication, so in dosage and administration. Um, if there's a chance that using symbols is going to be confusing, don't use symbols, spell out the words. Um, use of the slash, you need to consider the intent on that and make sure it's not confusing. If it's, um, it's often confused with the number one. Commonly used symbols may be preferable sometimes. I have some examples in the next slide. Use those with, in times when there's minimal risk medication errors and when the placement of symbols by words would make the understanding difficult or more lengthy. The examples on this slide, the first one it's spelled out greater than or less than and equal to, and it's e much easier to read and, and understand just using the symbols on that one as in the other two examples. You can refer to this later on if you'd like. Abbreviations. Abbreviations should be defined the first time they're used in highlights, and then redefine them again at the first use in the full prescribing information. Because often the inserts are not read from beginning to end. People 
there to be inserts and look at specific sections. And often in the acronym may be defined several pages prior in highlights. So go ahead and spell them out again, full prescribing information the first time they do it. Should express uncommon routes of administration in full, like intradermal and intrathecal. A helpful reference on this is a list of error prone abbreviations, symbols, dose designations um, by the Institute for Safe Medication Practices. In summary, I have a few tips for industry. Know and apply your guidances and regulations. Pay attention to the notes, the comments you get from FDA. Keep up with them. Apply their comments to other PIs. If there are consistent comments you're getting from FDA, go ahead and adapt standards. Make them your standards. Create a checklist. Above all, be consistent. Consistency is the key. Here's a list of my references. Thank you. All right, thank you, Eric and uh, Alyssa. That was great. I'm going to ask Anne Marie to come up to be our moderator because I just don't know labeling that well. But I'm up here to be the uh, ringmaster to explain since this is the first time we're doing Q&A the way our game will be played. For those of you online, thank you for the questions you've been submitting thus far. Please use the Q&A pod in the lower right hand corner to continue submitting those questions. Uh, for those of you in the room, if you have been uh, pulling questions together this whole time, making notes, we're going to invite you to stand up and come to the two microphones that we have in the aisles here. And what we'll be doing is just moving from microphone to microphone and then mixing in the online questions as well. Since uh, nobody's making that first move up to the microphone, it looks like we're going to start with an online question. Can we have our first online question, please? Yes, this is um, for Eric Brodsky. Could you comment on inclusion of information regarding effects of the drug on co comorbid conditions if data is available? What sections could potentially be considered? Could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Could you comment on inclusion of information in the prescribing information regarding effects the drug may have on comorbid conditions, what sections of the prescribing information could be considered for inclusion of this information? Oh, thank you for the question uh, from the online audience. Um, information about comorbid conditions could be spread throughout the labeling. So, for example, if you're talking about uh, patients with renal impairment or hepatic impairment, that information would be spread out. You could have information about those patients in the clinical study section of labeling. You can include information about pharmacokinetics in the clinical pharmacology section of labeling. You can include a high-level summary of that information in the use in specific population section of labeling. The dosage administration section of labeling could include dosage modifications. Um, that may be part of um, the indications in usage section that may be part of the approved population or subpopulations. So core morbid conditions are, can may be included throughout the prescribing information. Okay. And since we have our first question in the room, um, let me just uh, provide some more uh, logistics around that. Please keep to one question. If you have more than one question, that means you get to go back to the beginning of the line, which would be very easy for you in your case. <laughs> um, and then, if I could, I'm going to ask Anne Marie if you could listen to the question and then restate it uh, just to make sure that our online audience hears it properly. So, with those logistics in place, please, microphone number one. All right, thank you so much. And uh, my first question is well, my name is Camille Grenville from Bayer uh, Pharmaceutical. It's for Dr. Broski and, you know, as a clinical pharmacologist, I think very often. What I realized, and after four drug approval, I was involved. The question is always, okay, should we say contraindications or avoid? 
I think one of the key examples you provide this morning regarding the uh, renal um, hepatic uh, uh, renal impairment, where there was a 20-fold increase in the exposure in terms of uh, uh, severely renal impairment. So there was no information in terms of um, the dose, whether or not we should reduce the dose or whether or not we should, uh, the question is contraindication or avoid, because most of the label, yeah, uh, what we saw is avoid, not contraindication. So what is your best recommendation? To summarize the question is uh, regarding the difference between the terminology used, uh, contraindication versus avoiding labeling. Thank you for your question. Um, it, so contraindications according to the regulations or situations or settings or subpopulations in which the use of the drug, the risks of the use of the drug, always outweighs the benefits and must, one must never ever use the drug. In general, we try to limit contraindications we, because we don't want to deny patients the use of the drug. Um, if you have no information about the product, um, about its safety, um, for example, you don't want to just include a contraindication. Mm -hmm. um, terms like avoid use or not recommended in um, certain patient populations are other terms one considered that consider using. There may be other terms that may be considered a, a step down from a contraindication where one can use, potentially use the drug, where a contraindication is never, ever, ever, ever do it. Avoid or not recommended, there are maybe some considering factors, um, depending upon how the patient's doing, uh, depending, depending upon other uh, treatment options, availability of other drugs, um, those patient considerations. Um, so um, contraindications are clearly defined in our regulations and also in the warnings and precautions section of labor guidance. Does that address your question? I, I, would, <laughs> I would also that, like to That's add. close enough to a yes. Well, <laughs> I'm going to let you pick it up after the break. Well, just so I would we like to add, if, that, that, yeah, I would like to add if that's OK, please. Once you've made the call that something's in the mm. contraindication section of labeling, you only use the word contraindication. You don't mm. want to use the word avoid or any other term to be really clear. So once that information, it's, it's in that section, that's the only term you should use. These other terms, such as avoid, not recommended, those could be more pertinent to any of the other sections. So that, I'm not sure if that helps. But. OK, thank you. All right, thank you. Question, microphone number two, please, go ahead. Yeah, my question is for Melissa. So you did bring up the point that different divisions and different reviewers have style differences in the way they write the label. So when you're developing your in-house standards, how do you accommodate for that? Well, depends on um, what the comment is. We have our, we've specified our own template. And we have things set up on spacing, formatting, that sort of thing. And occasionally, our division will come back and ask us to change something. And provided we can convince the person who's dealing with FDA to go back to them and say, this is our standard. We provide an explanation for why we have a standard. And oftentimes, FDA will accept our, our recommendation for the way it is. In fact, most of the time, that's the case. Um, I would like to add, I, I agree with that. Um, if you have, if you have, um, if you're not aligned with the FDA on certain situations, provide a good rationale. Quote the guidance, quote the regulation. Um, um, and frequently we're like, great point. I mean, labeling is a development. It's, it's between the application holder and the FDA. And application holders have a vast experience. And we use that information to improve labeling. So let, please let us know. Um, thank you for the question. Okay, we're going to take an online question real quick before I do that. Online folks, just a reminder, the slides that are on your screen right now, at the bottom of them is a link to the session survey. You can just go ahead and click on that right now. Those of you in the room, if you have the PDF open on your laptop, you can also click on it there, or you can type that in and give us some feedback. But let's go with our next online question, please. This, this question is for Eric. Do you include the results of failed studies or uncontrolled long-term safety studies in the clinical studies section of labeling? Um, thank you for the question. Um, whether you include, you, so if the clinical studies section of labeling doesn't have to include all the studies. You sometimes, 
um, failed studies, studies that show lack of efficacy are included in the clinical studies section of labeling. Frequently, that occurs when you have several adequate and well-controlled studies um, that are well-conducted, and you, you truly believe the design was, was, was very good, you got the right population, and you believe the efficacy results. And you want to tell healthcare providers that the use of the drug in this subpopulation did not work. However, if you believe maybe we didn't get the right dosage, maybe we didn't look at the right endpoints, maybe we only had one study and we don't really know. We, you really need to test it more. You, you would not want to put it out there that the drug doesn't work in this indication. You may, you, um, so it really depends upon the data you have, the confidence in your trials you have. Um, so it, it depends upon the, situ, the product specific situation. Okay, and I believe microphone next, number two is the next one in line. Yeah, hi, my name is Tom Cantu with uh, GSK. Question for Dr. Brodsky around, uh, earlier you talked about avoiding suggesting non-approved doses in the clinical studies section, maybe an arm that was in the pivotal clinical trial didn't show efficacy or what have you. Uh, you want to comment on what about if the comparator arm might be a standard of care but not may not be approved in their product labeling? How do you approach that in the clinical study section? Uh, thanks for the question, Tom. Um, first of all, please call me Eric um, at, at the conference. Um, um, the, the question was about um, if you had a clinical study which had a comparator arm, how would you represent that comparator arm in the clinical study section of labeling? Is that correct? Yeah, but the twist on it is if that comparator arm, may, perhaps it's a standard of care, but that standard of care of dosing may not be in, in their approved label. Great, great question. Um, so with respect to that question, if the information is very important um, for healthcare providers to understand the use of the drug, uh, one could include uh, potentially that dosage regimen. Uh, we, we recognize that um, there may be some inconsistency with the other labeling. But if, if it's, um, other techniques would be just to state the drug name and not including the dosage regimen. Um, it probably would be a case by case basis depending upon the product. But I could see it going either way. Um, de um, depending upon um, the safety and efficacy of that other comparative product at that dosage, for example. Great question. Microphone number one, step up nice and close for me. Hi, my name is Karen Sita Oss from Camargo Pharmaceutical Services, and my question kind of follows the last online question. So, how does the agency decide when you should include um, subpopulations for efficacy in the labeling? Um, thank you for your question. The question was how does the FDA, uh, what considerations does the FDA use to include sub efficacy, uh, um, subgroup efficacy results in the labeling. So we, the clinical studies section, we, in, in general, we, good question. So we include, I guess it depends upon the subgroup, and now it depends upon the results, it depends upon the number, it depends upon the power of the study. In, in general, we try to include information about important demographics and baseline disease characteristics. Some of that information makes it to the labeling. We also have drug snapshots where we include subgroup efficacy analyses based upon democratic demographics and baseline characteristics that appear on labeling. But we generally try to include that information because we know stakeholders want that information, not just for efficacy, but also for adverse reaction section. But challenges are is that you may wind up with a very small group. You may have a group of only 10 patients in a certain category. And you really can't um, have a good conclusion about that. In those cases, we will not include that information. And you may make a statement that um, there's not enough information um, to look at um, certain subgroups. So again, it depends upon the information, uh, how large the, the subpopulations are. 
But the FDA does believe about getting, the, getting this in, information to the public, and we have the drug trial snapshots. Very good question. Okay, let's go ahead and take our next online question, then we'll come back here in the room. Next online question, please. If you have a, a new label for an NME, why would it have a revision date as well as a initial U.S. Uh, approval year? Um, very good question. Our regulations sometimes are complicated um, <laughs> and may not make sense. <laughs> so this may be one part of that. That's, it doesn't totally make sense. But according to our regulations, the initial U.S. approval is a four-digit number, um, which is based upon the initial, use, the initial approval of a new molecular entity new biological product, a new combination of active ingredients. And that's irrespective of the indication, the dosage form, the route administration, or the manufacturer. And the purpose of the initial use approval is so you could provide the healthcare provider audience uh, some information about the safety of the product. So for example, uh, my understanding, EpiPen was approved in the 1980s. I think it was approved in 1987. However, the first epinephrine product was approved in the United States in 1939. So the initial use approval is 1939 for EpiPen, even though EpiPen was approved in 1987. So it's to signify that epinephrine has been around in use in the United States. And it's really from a safety perspective. The revision date um, that includes the month and the year um, at the end of highlights is a different concept according to our regulations. So that's the month and the year that any aspect of the prescribing information change. So whether you add a new indication, a new dosage regimen, or you made a small editing change, that any change will change the revision date. And going back to Melissa's point, I think Melissa had a great point, that the date on the, the revision date of the prescribing information may differ from the date on patient labeling. If the patient labeling is updated in October 2017, but the last time the prescribing information was updated was in August 2001, you could have different dates. Uh, thank you for the question. And our next question in the room, microphone number two, nice and close for us. Hi, my name is Luke from Kiwa Kieran. I have a couple questions, so you could kick me off if you need okay. to. All right. so. Um, First is uh, in regards to like the dosage forms, and uh, you might have spoken to this before, so forgive me if you already have, but the difference between injection and then for injection, what would that be? Uh, good question. So this is according to USP nomenclature. So injections are considered solutions that are administered as injections to patients. And that's the terminology is injection. Um, products that are supplied as a powder, like a lyophilized powder, that is reconstituted in a solution and then injected, for example, intravenous use or even subcutaneous use, the dosage form terminology, according to USP nomenclature practices, is for injection. Also, according to established USP monographs. So the dosage form, if there's an established USP monograph, the labeling must follow the established USP monograph. And let's go ahead and take an online question, then we'll get the next, next question in the room. For section 14, is it best to reference the study, so refer to the studies as uh, study 1, 2, 3, study ABC, or as a study identifier such as the name? Or is this um, practice dependent upon the review division's preference? Cool. An another great question. So the clinical study section of labeling guidance uh, does not discuss this of how do we name studies in the clinical study section of labeling. Uh, and we don't have other guidance that um, provides FDA's current thinking about how to name studies throughout labeling. Uh, one can um, consider 
using NCT numbers on first use of the description of the study in the clinical study section of labeling in section 14. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, because the study um, the studies are used all across many different forms to identify the studies. But back to your particular question using studies, study one, study two, study three, using an acronym or the sponsor assigned study title. The FDA is talking internally about this and we're willing for the application holder to propose different methods um, at, at this time. Um, um, again, we do not have guidance about this, and so a the agency has not finalized its thinking on this area. Thank you for the question. Okay, microphone number two, please. Yeah, forgive me if this is in the SERPI, I can't remember, but um, when we have to put the vertical lines in the left margin to indicate where a change to a section has been made, does the line um, cover the entire section, all the paragraphs, or just the lines that have um, another great question. Uh, so we don't have particular guidance okay. um, or there's no regulatory requirement about the length of that line. Um, I think it depends upon a case-by-case -case basis. Um, in general, we try to focus on the changes that are made, the substantial changes that are made. Um, for example, if there's only one paragraph or two sentences that are changed, uh, you, um, you could consider using that line over those two sentences or paragraphs rather than the entire for example, the dosage administration section. Mm -hmm. However, there may be some situations where one line changed and it's part of a paragraph and the line goes over. You, you may have to use the entire two lines. Mm -hmm. So in general, we try to focus on only the substantial changes that were made, but sometimes because of carryovers, uh, leftovers, you would have to extend that a little bit longer. Okay. But again, we do not have uh, the agency is not doesn't have final thinking on this topic. We don't have guidance on it. Go ahead, it's Mike. Um, now, I remember you uh, mentioning the NCT number was uh, encouraged to put in, be put in the labeling. So my question is, uh, when you're referring to those pivotal trials, do you prefer them to be referred to as like study one, study two, or study three, or the actual title of the clinical trial. So for example, I think in your example, it was like the Monarch trial. What's best uh, to report in the actual like, labeling? Um, so um, the FDA doesn't have um, final guidance in this area. It's not in the clinical study section of labeling guidance. It's also not in any other guidances. So we don't have any final uh, recommendations with respect to that. We um, recommend application holders propose um, something to include in labeling. I should say that um, we've seen certain situations with the use of acronyms where that information potentially could obscure required or recommended information in labeling. So particularly if you have a section six and you're describing the study, different pools of studies, and you're saying a certain pool is in um, acronym one, acronym two, acronym three, and acronym four, it may be very difficult to understand. But that may be a labeling issue that can be addressed. Um, we recommend a consistent approach without labeling. So if you use an acronym, um, you could potentially define the acronym in the clinical studies section and state um, study one in other sections of labeling. That, would, that may be a way to get around that. Um, um, but one wouldn't want to use five different types of terminology for a study throughout the labeling. You would want to be consistent. Uh, we um, do look at the entire prescribing information to see that the information is not false or misleading. So if an application holder proposed the use of the name cure trial in an incurable disease, um, that potentially would be misleading. Um, and uh, we um, potentially would be concerned about that. So misleading information anywhere in the labeling, which would include proposed applicants, um, could be concerning. All right, we've got about four more minutes left for Q&A. If anybody in the room wants to come up, let's take our next online question, please. This question is from Melissa. How do you ensure that information and in highlights is consistent with the information in the full prescribing information? Okay, thank you for the question question was, how do I ensure that the information in highlights is consistent with the information in the full prescribing information? 
it's something that has to be checked. Um, information will change in the pool prescribing information that does change the information in highlight. Um, it's just one of our checks that we do when we do our check before we submit a document to the FDA and prior to approval that we do check that. One of the reasons that is one of our checks is because we did have an error in one of those one time. We discussed the clinical trial and described it wrong um, in full prescribing and in the highlights as compared to full prescribing information. A little minor thing, no big deal. But we every time we have an incident like that, we update our checklist. So um, our checklist is getting a little lengthy. <laughs> 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 but we do check everything. Um, and if we have any questions, if my group has any questions, then we go back to the actual label writers and ask them about it. it it's um, to add that that's great, fantastic that you have this checklist. Um, um, to add one of the techniques we use, if you have two screens, so you put up the highlights and prescribing information. If you work on the dosage administration heading and highlights, I put up the dosage administration section in the FPI, and I compare back and forth go over every element to make sure it's consistent. So sometimes we see not only inconsistency, we see lack of information. The really important information that you want to tell people about important administration instructions, or maybe you, you um, there's not, it, does, it lacks about dosage adjustments due to adverse reactions or drug interact, or dosage um, specific populations. So you do a double check, two screens. You can use a split screen potentially. Um, or if you're a paper person, print out two copies of paper. Go to the FPI. Go to the highlights on each each part. Uh, but that that's fantastic that GSK um, has that checklist to look at all these things before approval. This is great. And another thing, when if you're creating a new insert, the highlight section would be something that you do, you know, after your text is pretty well settled in the full prescribing. You don't want to go ahead and start your highlights and have to adjust your highlights every time you change something in full prescribing information. All right. Microphone number two, step up nice and close for me, please. Hi there. This is Nancy Bowman from Alder Biopharmaceuticals. I have a question with regards to avoiding dosing errors and making sure there's clarity in the label. Um, if a drug is supplied as IV for single use, single use vials, and it turns out that the approved dosage would involve administration of more than one vial. Um, what sections of the label would you um, suggest that clarification is provided to avoid any dosing errors? Because I think it could be confusing. Um, very good question. To repeat the question, the question was about if you have a product um, where uh, administration recommendations for dosage in a certain population or all populations require the use of more than one vial. Where would you communicate that information? I, I agree that's very important information. And that information you can include um, in the dosage administration section. So occasionally we do include how supply type of information in the dosage administration. If it's something that leads to medication errors, that would be a situation where you include potentially how supplied information. Sometimes we've seen tables, recommended dosage, amount, how many vials, for example. Um, so typical vial information is in how supplied, but if it involves reducing a medication error, that information could be in the dosage administration section. Um, it could also be in the dosage administration heading and highlights if it's very important to reduce medication errors. Thank you for your question. Can I follow up on that? In that case, you'd still label them single dose vial. Um, the, according to our, um, the draft guidance that we have, uh, which a very lengthy name about package terms for um, injectable drug products, the terminology we have is single dose, multiple dose, or single patient use. And a lot of folks have had concerns about that type of statement. Uh, one can include uh, some type of additional statement um, about about that. So use the term single dose, but include a parenthetical that one may need to include more, more than one vial. We've also had the situation where you're not using the entire vial, vial for like pediatric patients. You can include, we can consider including a disclaimer or some information in a parenthetical 
um, that not the entire vial is used. That term single dose is part of that guidance and it's part of the nomenclature. But we recognize the problems associated with that. Okay, and that is all the time that we have for Q&A. Please help me thank Melissa, Anne-Marie, and Eric for your presentation.